Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. Good morning. Glad to welcome each one of you to our worship Sunday, the worship this uh, Sunday, uh, which is Palm Passion Sunday. Uh, we're so pleased that you've chosen to uh, gather with her, us here today. We'd also like to welcome those who were with us by other means that may be listening on the radio or those who are streaming us live or will be looking at it a little later in the week. Uh, we trust that God will bless you uh, however you are investing these next few moments, whenever that may be. Uh, there are just a few announcements that I would call your attention to. Those of you that are here will find the majority of these there in your bulletins. Uh, just a reminder, if I think all the children are probably out in the narthex at this point, they'll be coming in waving the palm branches as we do each uh, Palm Sunday. I would just caution everybody who's sitting on the edge of an aisle, kind of watch it. You don't want to get poked in the eye on Palm Sunday with, uh, with the edge of a palm. Uh, that could actually happen depending on how enthusiastic our, uh, our palm branch wavers are. Uh, so you've been warned. Uh, please take cover. Uh, also, uh, the uh, children will be having their choir practice this afternoon at 4 with Dr. Edwards. They'll be uh, sharing their music with us next Sunday uh, during the worship service. Uh, also, the youth will be uh, heading out to the Easter play tonight. Uh, at uh, The play's at 6 o'clock. Uh, Dave will be here at 5.30 uh, to uh, uh, get everybody organized and get everybody over there on time. Uh, also, this Wednesday night, we will not be having prayer service because it's Holy Week. We'll be having our Maundy Thursday service, and that will be at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We hope that you'll come. Uh, but also, uh, Dave will be, will be having choir rehearsal on uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. So we invite everyone uh, to come and be a part of that as well. Then on Saturday, our, our hot dog uh, lunch and Easter egg uh, hunt is uh, going to be taking place. There's still, if you need to bring some candy by by the middle of the week, that would be fine. Uh, appreciate all that have brought uh, those items that are out there. We're certainly helping uh, as we uh, uh, prepare to uh, celebrate uh, the uh, a fun time on Saturday. Any volunteers that would like to come and help hide eggs and do some things like that, if you come about uh, 30 to uh, 15 to 30 minutes ahead of time, that will help us out. This coming Saturday, we'll be back in the fellowship hall. That starts at 10 and we'll finish up at noon. Uh, then bright and early on Easter Sunday, we'll be having our sunrise service at 7 o'clock. Uh, that will be uh, out in the back yard, back near the uh, Boy Scout hut. Uh, that will be at 7 o'clock. If the weather is bad, we'll meet inside. Uh, but uh, most likely we'll be outside and then we'll come into the fellowship hall and enjoy uh, a breakfast uh, there in the fellowship hall afterwards as a time of fellowship. And then of course at 11 o'clock we'll be celebrating uh, Easter Sunday uh, here in, in our sanctuary. Uh, beyond that though, uh, the 19th, uh, that Tuesday, the uh, elderberries will be having their regular meeting. Uh, they're going to be uh, talking about a trip they're going to be taking on the 27th. Uh, down to Old Brunswick and Southport, uh, a lunch trip. So uh, if you come and enjoy the program on the 19th, you'll have opportunity to uh, have input on what is taking place uh, coming up on the 27th. And also just a reminder of our blood drive uh, that will be uh, going on on the 26th here in our fellowship hall. You have uh, contact information there in your bulletin. Those are all the announcements we'll call your attention to. We do hope you'll take time to read uh, the details of those that are important to you and your family. But as we begin our worship this day on Palm Sunday, uh, we begin uh, with a, a, a very um, familiar passage of scripture from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's written word. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May the Lord bless to our hearts and to our minds these words of Scripture today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we remember how on that first Easter season, the Palm Sunday, as people spread their coats and palm branches on the ground to welcome Jesus as he made his way into Jerusalem, we also come and welcome you into our lives this day. But we know you now completely more as the King of glory, the King of peace, the servant King. And Lord, we pray that you would reign in our hearts and lives today and all the days that you give us, that we might bring praise to your holy and precious name. Yet, Lord, we know it is a strange paradox we, as we remember the people singing and rejoicing and shouting Hosanna in the highest, and they were expecting an earthly king who came with armies and swords to conquer. But Jesus came as a servant king to wash the feet of the least and the lowest, to show us love in such a powerful way that not even death could conquer it, your sacrificial love poured out on the cross. So, Lord, as we sing our hosannas today, may we remember also that you were riding towards suffering and rejection and pain and humiliation and the cruelty of the cross. And we also pray, Lord, that you would help us to look forward to the joy of Easter, celebrating the resurrection which is the death of death forever. Lord, help us this day to truly allow your spirit to lead us and guide us as we seek to be faithful to your call upon our lives. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ, who taught us as his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing. or you can grab a copy of the Bible's best friend, the hymnal, and find hymn 97. And we're going to sing, if I have the voice, you help me out, all four verses of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And let's sing big as the children come in waving their palm branches. <laughs>
so much. You may be seated. If we have any children that are in the back that aren't up on the front row, we'd like to invite you to come down for our children's moments at this time. Are you coming? There we go. All right. We had a lot of help from some of our younger folks today with the palm branches, and we appreciate y'all coming and being good leaders and helping with that today. Do you know today is Palm Sunday? And one of the big things about Palm Sunday was like a parade. Have y'all been to a parade before? I bet you've probably been in a parade, haven't you? Reese, were you in a parade? Which one? Do you remember? <laughs> what about you, Liam? Yeah, I watched the parade. Yeah, on like maybe Thanksgiving Day. Preston, how about you? You seen the parades? Yeah, you can see them on TV. Or have y'all ever been to the Strawberry Festival? They have, yeah, they have a parade. Yeah, don't they have a parade every year? Yeah, in fact, I bet you're, yeah, you're going to have a good time with that this year. It's coming back. And I know that there are lots of other times, maybe Christmas, you have parades all up and down the streets. And when you have a special occasion, yes, Liam. Which one did you watch? The Christmas one. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Santa is usually there in those Christmas parades, and you have the cheerleaders, and you have the bands, and you have all kinds of different oh, folks that are up. The yeah, that's exciting, isn't it? Well, the parade that we talk about today on Palm Sunday, it's a little bit different than that. It was uh, probably the most special time in all the year was the Feast of the Passover. And for us, it would be like maybe Christmas is probably our biggest celebration uh, for us as Americans. But uh, for uh, in Jesus' day, the Feast of the Passover was very important. It was so important that it was held once a year and people really wanted to go to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. It was the place to go. So there were people there from literally all around the world. And they had heard about Jesus and they had heard the things that he had done and what he was doing. And then they heard that he was coming to town. And so as he was coming in, it was kind of like a parade, but it really wasn't a parade, was it? It was just Jesus and his disciples and they were coming in. But the people made it a special occasion by tearing branches off of the palm trees and taking their coats off if they couldn't get a palm branch and laying it down. And the reason they did that was that's how you treated a king, somebody that was very, very important. Yes, Liam? You want to know how it looks like in heaven? What does it look like in heaven? Gold. Yeah, that's and right. That's right. Heaven is, a like heaven is a special place. And as Jesus was coming, though, the people were excited because it was something that was, uh, uh, they, they were just, they loved Jesus because Jesus loved everybody. He helped those who were poor. He healed those who were sick. He helped to feed the hungry people. Uh, and the people just loved him so much. That's why when they heard he was coming, they were so excited. And that's the reason that we wave the palm branches on Palm Sunday because we remember the joy that they had. Today is my papa's birthday. Wonderful. That is great. Yeah, and I'm celebrating it. Well, good. I'm glad. Well, let's take a moment and thank God that he's given us the opportunity to celebrate uh, the joy that the people had then and let that be a part of our joy now in, in celebrating what Jesus has done for us, okay? Lord, we do thank you so much for your love. We thank you for all that you have done to show us how much you care. And we pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us as we uh, consider your love and how important it is to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You can get a, a piece of candy and go with We come now to a time of praying for people and situations and I want to begin by asking if there's any unspoken out there you'd like us to pray for you, but uh, you don't really want to share what it is, but it's always good to know that God knows what every need is. So if you would, just 
slip up your hand so that we can see you. We can look and see who those hands belong to, and we'll pray for you by name. So thank you so much for that. We want to uh, continue to remember uh, Hunter Williamson, uh, who was deployed to Poland, as well as our uh, associational missionary, Matthew Ward, in Hungary. Uh, we want to continue to remember Kay Honeycutt's son, Wade Williamson. Uh, we hope that he is continuing to get stronger and better. Miss Kay, is that? Okay, all right. So we pray that that happens fast. Uh, Denise Gerst, this is uh, the wife of one of Sammy Sibbett's co-workers, uh, had surgery, and Sammy Sibbett, who, uh, who needs to be staying at home doing nothing, but like some of us, we just don't listen to the doctor and insist that we're strong enough to get out there and do. So may God just impress upon him the need to just take it easy and do nothing. We want to shout out a praise to uh, Krista Fowler. Uh, she had to be taken to uh, Columbus Regional and had a clot on her lung but uh, she's going to get to go home. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, see her uh, pulmonologist and cardiologist, and she loves you, and you can show your love right back to her by not visiting her, okay? Just pray for her. Text her, call her, uh, send her a dozen roses if you want, but try to back off from going to see her. But it is a rejoicing thing uh, that she is feeling much stronger and... Uh, feeling very optimistic, so we're very happy about that. We want to remember and extend our Christian sympathies to the family of Edwin Stevens. Uh, his service was yesterday. We want to continue to pray for healing for Mona Edwards' grandson. Three years old, he fell and broke his arm, so we pray for healing on that. Uh, and then our prayer list. Names come and go, but there's always a lot of names on that prayer list. And it may seem overwhelming to us at times, even when dealing with our own needs. But isn't it wonderful that we serve a God that hears all our prayers and knows all our needs and will answer all our prayers? Now, true, it may not be the answer that we're looking for or the answer that we want, but there's a reason. Sometimes we're meant to know, sometimes we're not. But God is there. And God hears our prayers and know that God loves you. Let us go to him in prayer. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you that Christians everywhere are celebrating what Palm Sunday is all about. This is a very special week. And as we get into it, the events that lead up to next Sunday's Resurrection Sunday may seem dark. But there are reasons for these events and all of them have God underwriting the fact that he loves us and has put his own son out as a lamb of sacrifice. Lord, with these prayers that have been mentioned and the ones that are written upon the heart, we rejoice that you will answer them in your own way and in your own time. Help us to get in line with what your way is. Initiate in us what we need to do to show that we are a follower of Christ. To these that we have mentioned, and most especially to the lost. May we be reminded all this week of what Jesus went through to show his love for us. These things we ask in your most holy name. Amen. We are so grateful for the folks that are continually giving of their tithes and offerings. And we thank you and know that God is going to honor these tithes and offerings through the ministries of Chadburn Baptist Church and beyond. There are many different ways to give and to be that cheerful giver. And we thank you for the ways that you choose to honor God. The chorus of 112, Jesus' name above all names, only scratches the surface of the names 
that have been given to Jesus. And I'm going to ask us to stand and we'll sing through this little chorus. And these may be names that you yourself have used to describe a Savior who loves us. The words are on the screen and it's hymn 112. Stand with me. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed. I want to go ahead and tell you that next Sunday we do hope to have a choir up here and that we are going to sing a song that, well, for one thing, the choir has done before and it is entitled, It Is Finished, Wonderful Gaither Peace, and it may be a song that you know. It's a very easy song to pick up and I hope that we might see you Wednesday night at 7 and before the service starts in the choir room next Sunday morning. So don't say to yourself, I can't do it. He doesn't need me. You're wrong. I need you. I need you. And you see where this finger is pointing? Everywhere. Maybe not so much towards Gail, but, <laughs> you know, Gail, don't, uh, don't be mad at me, okay? But, but you auditioned for me once, and... I just had to Simon Cowell her. Getting serious right now. Today when we look back at the windswept hill called Calvary, we see not the home of death and despair, but the birthplace of life and hope. It was there at the cross that God wrote his eternal message of love to each of us in crimson letters, the cleansing blood of his son, Jesus. In letters of crimson, God wrote his love on a hillside so long, long ago. For you and for me, Jesus died, and love's greatest story was told. I love you, I love you, that's what Calvary said. I love you, I love you, I love you, written in red. love with the same hands that suffered and bled giving all he had to give a message so easily read I love
Thank you so much, Dave and Joyce, for a very special anthem this morning. Our scripture text is another familiar passage of scripture as we come uh, to this season of the year. Mark 11, one, I mean Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. Mark 14, verses 1 through 11. Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's written word. Now the, fest, the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread were only two days away. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at a table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It would have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. They rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. And they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. May the Lord bless to our hearts and to our minds this portion of God's written word today. Thank you so much. You may be seated. As many of you know, my, uh, Angie, my son, has lived in Boston for almost 10 years now. And I'd never really been in and out of Boston, didn't have a reason to go until my son was there. And then I had a real good reason to go. And uh, one time when we were visiting, we uh, took a little tour down through the middle of Boston. And uh, it was a wonderful time looking at all the sites that were there, all kinds of things that are there. If you've ever been to Boston, it is indeed a beautiful, beautiful place. But as we were walking down through the heart of the city, suddenly, without warning, we were confronted with the horror of a past evil. If you've been through the city, you know that there is a memorial to the Holocaust. And it's right there in the middle of town. And it's built in a corridor that runs about a city block. And it's a moving tribute to a lady by the name of Gerda Weissman Klein. Gerda experienced firsthand the horror of the German concentration camps there in the Second World War. And it's hard for us to imagine the stark conditions of those camps, no matter how hard we try. But in the midst of the hate and violence of the Nazi regime, Gerda tells a lovely story filled with beauty and grace that has not soon forgotten. Gerda was befriended by a young Jewish girl by the name of Elise. And one day coming home from a work party, Elise found a delicious raspberry. And a raspberry was such a delicacy in such a harsh environment of the concentration camp, Elise reaches down and grasps the raspberry, puts it in her ragged pocket, and she saves it to lovingly share it with her friend Gerda that night. And in her remembrances, Gerda says, imagine a world in which your entire possession is one raspberry and someone shares it with you as an act of friendship. That is indeed a haunting story to think in such a hostile place such a lovely act could still live on as a testimony to the enduring spirit and triumph of human love and ultimately I would think even godly love Elise left a, a lovely fragrance that still fills the heart and mind of her friend years after the stench of hatred and evil of the Nazi regime was being eradicated from the face of the earth. 
I don't know about you, but as she talked about it as being such a beautiful fragrance, it caught my attention as well, because there are certain fragrances that uh, lie in, in, in the back of your mind that, that, uh, that bring back a flood of memories. Uh, for me, the, a certain smell of the pine trees takes me back to a part of my childhood that I spent playing in the woods all around my house, uh, building a fort, playing all sorts of games with my friends, running through the woods. There's a certain smell that comes from some plant that blooms in the mountains around August that immediately reminds me of the start of football practice and all those long days that were spent practicing there on the football field and then ultimately playing the games. And I'm certain that Gerda never smelled or tasted a raspberry again in her life without remembering her friend Elise. There was another Jewish woman who left a fragrance in Jesus' life. Uh, we talked about her last week. Uh, it was John's uh, re retelling of a story of an event. Could have been that there were two events that happened. We don't really know. But John tells it as, as taking place in the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Uh, this place, uh, this story today, although it's very, very similar, takes place in the home of Simon the leper. But there's also kind, all kinds of fragrances that are floating around there in our passage of Scripture today. With Simon, we get the fragrance of a meal, the gift of hospitality. With Mary, the fragrance of perfume, uh, which is a, a, a sign of her great devotion and her recognizing Jesus as being the king that God was sending to his people and then, of course, we find Judas again, the stench of hatred, the smell of greed. But we first encounter the fragrance of hospitality, this meal provided by one of Jesus' friends. Certainly, it's in the last week of Jesus' life. His ministry was filled with all kinds of contrasts. The crowds that adored him on that Palm Sunday that were still supporting him, even at these moments, uh, filling the air with shouts of praise of Hosanna. And certainly, we know that that would change toward the end of the week. But he does not seem to acknowledge or uh, uh, to uh, wallow in the praise of the people that are there. He continues to be about following God's call upon his life, uh, even to the point of going into the temple and throwing out the money changers and doing that in a very public way. And as we've often noted, uh, you can have theological differences with people, but when you start messing with the money, you're going to get killed. And that's pretty much what happened. When Jesus started messing with the money, that was the last straw. And so they put their actions, uh, put action, uh, the hatred that they had felt in their heart toward him all along. But as we look here in our text, uh, it's most likely on Wednesday. And we see that Jesus didn't go into the temple that day. Uh, he stayed there in the town of Bethany. And naturally, we wonder if Simon was one of the lepers who Jesus had personally cleansed with his healing touch and the encounters that he had had with lepers so many times throughout his earthly ministry. It doesn't tell us ex with certainty that that was uh, how Simon the leper had been healed. Uh, but we do know that he, if he had been a leper, then he knew that he had been condemned by the law. And if he had been healed, he had been healed by the touch of God's grace. And you get this sense of gratitude uh, for the uh, surrounding the activities there, that this meal was being provided for Jesus and his disciples. And so it was indeed a wonderful fragrance to Jesus uh, because we don't believe he had too many home-cooked meals during his three-year ministry. He was out on the road, the dusty roads, uh, uh, walking with his disciples from place to place, stopping and pausing and preaching and teaching and healing and doing all those wonderful things that we see uh, recorded for us there in the pages of the New Testament, but sitting down for a wonderful home-cooked meal was not very often a part of Jesus' life at that point in time. And no doubt for Jesus, just as it would have been for, me, for each one of us, the fragrances of the food would have brought back to his memory 
times that he spent growing up caring for his mother and father and all of his brothers and sisters and enjoying uh, the, the fellowship there around the table. No doubt his mind was flooded with memories of his childhood and, and the, all the wonderful things that he had experienced growing up. But meanwhile, we know that as he's enjoying the wonderful fragrances that are taking place, the forces behind the scenes are already at work, working to begin to make their move. We learned there in the first two verses that uh, the adversaries were already looking for some way to kill him. Uh, they'd been looking for a way, a way to kill him since he had raised Lazarus from the dead in such a public way. And now as he was here in the city... Uh, there in Jerusalem on the Passover, they were looking uh, for ways in which to end this sore spot, uh, this one who didn't just let them do whatever they wanted to do, uh, those who were in control and those who were in power, the scribes and the Pharisees. But here as uh, Jesus is enjoying this meal, and not, not literally the last meal, but probably the last joyous meal, we find that fragrance of hospitality uh, being given to him by a friend. The latter part of verse 3, this unnamed woman shows up. And uh, William Barclay, I think, is one who uh, gives some good insight into this. He said in that region, in that time of day, uh, t the uh, meals that were given like this one was often out in a courtyard, making it a public event. And when famous people or a distinguished teacher was present, uh, the people would hear that there was a meal that was being uh, presented, and they weren't necessarily invited to the meal, but they would gather around, uh, sort of uh, uh, on the outside, looking in to, to hear what this distinguished teacher uh, might say, what the conversation and the table talk was all about. And this woman shows up, and many, of course, believe it was Mary, the, Mar Mar uh, Mary, the uh, sister of Lazarus. Uh, and uh, as she comes, though, in this text, in Mark's telling of what takes place, uh, John, last week, she broke the uh, perfume and anointed Jesus' feet. And the fragrance in the filled the air with perfume. But here, this Mary shows up, and she does not break the, break the uh, perfume seal and pour it on Jesus' feet, she actually anoints Jesus' head. And she breaks the container. All of that has tremendous significance to the people who were sitting there looking to see what was going on. It was a custom in that day and time. If you had a distinguished guest come to your home, once he finished the meal, his cup and his plate, everything would be broken and tossed aside so that no person's lips or hands would ever touch those utensils ever again because the person was of such great importance who had used them there in their company. And so as she doesn't just screw the top off, she breaks the container as if we're never going to use this again. There's never going to be anybody more important than the person that we're going to be using this on ever again. She breaks it and she pours it on Jesus' head. She pours it on Jesus' head. And it's talked about as being indeed an anointing. Now, we've talked about trying to figure out who and why, love, devotion, all those kinds of things, maybe a freedom from guilt that maybe Mary had experienced. But certainly here, we were seeing acted out in very real form her great devotion. And of course, whenever devotion, whenever great grace is shown, there's always opposition. Uh, the opposition here is not named as quickly as specifically coming from Judas as John did last week. But it was the group were appalled that this huge, expensive act had taken place. This bottle of pure nard had been crushed, in effect, and poured on Jesus' head. 
But Jesus again stands up for this woman and says, she's done a beautiful thing. She's done all that she could do. And whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. She had great insight. Certainly this was very important because in pouring the, uh, the expensive perfume not on Jesus' feet but on his head, she was in effect anointing him. Now if you look through the scriptures, you'll find that only three people, three types of people were ever anointed on their head. Only three in Jewish history. The priests, when they were accepted their calling, the priests were anointed on their head. Prophets were often anointed on their head, and kings were anointed on their head. And here in Jesus, of course, as Christians, we know that all three of these things were perfectly combined in Jesus. He was the high priest. He is the great prophet. He is indeed the king of all and everything. And Mary, realizing all three of these offices found in Christ, in effect with her actions, she was uh, showing that she understood Jesus' identity before the twelve men who had followed him for three years had picked up on it, anointing him as a king whose kingdom was uh, alone worthy of the best that she had. And the extravagance was not simply a gesture. She was crowning Jesus with this anointing, this perfume that she was pouring on him. And in the midst of the fragrance of hospitality of this wonderful meal that the whole community could smell, now above it, drowning it all out almost, was this costly perfume that was indeed a tribute not only to this woman, but also a tribute to Jesus himself. To Jesus himself who was anointed uh, by this action. And Mark goes on to tell us that, uh, that Judas uh, was probably the one who was leading the protest about the, uh, the, the cost of this perfume that has been wasted. That somehow they were uh, slighting the poor uh, because of what was taking place. And as we talked about last week, that's always sort of a tension uh, throughout our Christian, uh, Christian walk. Yes, we need to help folks. We need to build houses with Habitat for Humanity. We need to feed hungry people. We need to build hospitals. We need to build orphanages. We need to do all of those things. But ultimately, we know that there is something deeper than the physical needs of our lives, and that is what speaks to our soul, the depth and the hunger of our spirit. And both are important. The hungry need to be fed and the sick cared for, but certainly we need to feed our souls as well. That uh, that's, uh, just taking care of the physical needs is not really enough. That we need to have our souls touched. We need to have our souls cared for. We need to have that uh, connection to the divine God who loves us and cares, cares for us. And that is indeed still the charge of the church, to care for those that are around us, but also to lead folks into a life-changing relationship that will nourish them for, throughout all eternity. Yes, Mary needed to give this gift to Jesus to show her love and her devotion, but Judah's agenda was totally different. He was more uh, uh, thinking about the dollars and cents. We know from other places that he was the bookkeeper, the accountant, uh, driven, no doubt, by the bottom line. And I think that you can always sense the tension that takes place uh, whenever you have a, a large group of people uh, together. You have some that are warm and outgoing and expressive, and you have others who are a bit more cold, a bit more reserved, a bit less... Uh, willing to be overtaken by uh, any type of an emotional uh, type of, of outburst or emotional uh, type of action. And there is a place for both types of people. Uh, there is a place for uh, both types of attitudes. But here in this moment, it was a pivotal moment. And Mary's expression was to rule the day. But 
just because she did what was right didn't keep Judas from doing what was wrong. Uh, he went immediately and he began to betray Jesus. Even as she's criticized for her extravagance, we know that she was expressing a greater need to satisfy the deepest longings of our human heart through her devotion to God. And we know that, that this was not something against what Jesus was talking about in caring for the poor. He spent the first 13 chapters of Mark's gospel uh, teaching them how to reach out and help those that were in need. Uh, but here it was a time and a place for great extravagance in their devotion to give uh, the best that they had, to uh, understand that, that Jesus and his presence and what he was about and what he was about to do was something that was worth celebrating. It was something worth inaugurating. It was something that was worth anointing with the very best of the best. And that's something that we see uh, acting out here before us, here around this table on Wednesday of Holy Week, as Jesus and his disciples are there, and the whole town is gathered around as well, we see different, different expressions of devotion. Simon did what he could do in providing a meal for his friend, maybe the one who had healed him. Mary gave the best that she had to show her uh, complete devotion, to show uh, that she had recognized in Jesus far more than just a wonderful teacher but one who was indeed uh, truly the Son of God, one who was making a difference uh, in every aspect of her lives. And then sadly, we also see Judas, who is almost unaffected by what has taken place. And in fact, I think that as we consider uh, the tone of what is said there, uh, that there is another smell that comes, and it's the stench of hatred, of greed, of self uh, aggrandizement rather uh, contrasted with what Jesus is about to show uh, the, the rest of the world and being willing to give himself totally and completely surrendering his life for the sins of everyone who has ever lived. And certainly that's important for us to all keep in mind as we go through this, this week that's filled with contradictions. We start with Palm Sunday and if we just did Palm Sunday and then went to next Sunday and went to the resurrection, you'd sort of go through life thinking, well, isn't that nice? Christianity is just a nice little story. Jesus came in and they waved some palm leaves at him. And then the next Sunday, well, he got up from the grave. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it is. It's a wonderful story. But there was a lot of things that took place between the coming in on Palm Sunday and what took place on Resurrection Sunday morning. Uh, why did he need to be raised? Because he was brutally tortured and suffered. But he chose to allow God's will to be accomplished in his life. And he did so showing the cost of God's love. You know, we're not here to just get cheap grace. We can do whatever we want to and just say, hey, forgive me. Well, that's not what forgiveness is about, is it? That's not what repentance is about. Repentance involves uh, uh, understanding the depth of our sin, understanding the depth of our rebellion, understanding what the cost of our salvation was all about. That Jesus chose to make that sacrifice on our behalf so that we might truly receive forgiveness, that we might truly be uh, known as the children of God, and that we might experience life here and in life throughout all eternity. So in these next moments, where as we conclude our service this morning and we get ready to sing our hymn of response, would encourage you to use this as a time to reflect upon what is taking place in your life, what is maybe the fragrance that your life and your commitment is leaving and reflecting on the life of, of, of your Christian faith. Are you filled with a sense of, uh, of, of gratitude, a sense of devotion, or maybe you need to be reminded of how important it is to receive the sacrifice that Christ has made uh, in, your, in your life. It may be that you are here or listening by means of 
the internet or radio and you've never asked the Lord into your heart and into your life. And if that is indeed the situation that you find yourself in this day, I would encourage you right now to ask the Lord to come into your heart and into your life and to forgive you of your sin, that you might truly understand what the joy of resurrection is all about, that you might understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that you might understand uh, how important it is for those who are believers to celebrate the events of this week, this holy week, because what we celebrate next week makes all the difference in the world for all time and all eternity. And if you've asked Christ into your heart and into your life, that, thing, that can begin right now, right today. So in these next moments as we stand, uh, we'll sing our closing hymn, which is the Old Rugged Cross, hymn number uh, 186 in your hymnal. Uh, you'll need to look there. It will not be on the screen, but hymn number 186 in your hymnal. Dave, you come and lead us as, uh, uh, in, in our hymn, and I'll be at the front to help anyone who has need of making any type of public commitment this day. <laughs> fellowship with those that you have worshiped beside let's bow now for a word of benediction lord again we are grateful and humbled as we have the opportunity to exercise our faith in you through our corporate worship and now lord we pray that as we go from here that you would lead us as we seek to be your faithful people sharing the good news with those that you bring across our path this this week we offer this prayer in the name of christ Amen. Thank